Uh, I'm Brent Barbie from the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, I will be co-chairing this session along with my colleague uh, Patrick Michel, um, who is also here. Okay, there's Patrick up there. Patrick? <laughs> oh, there's Patrick. <laughs> So we will be your hosts for the afternoon. Um, our first talk is going to be given by Megan Brock Sial, a researcher at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories. So Megan, the floor is yours. I did, I'll, I'll, but it was noisy, I'll reintroduce it. Again, the, the topic for our session is deflection and disruption models and testing. Here we go. All right. Thank you, Brent. Uh, kinetic impactor and standoff nuclear explosion are two of the most mature technologies for achieving an asteroid deflection. And a kinetic impactor, while effective over a range of scenarios, does have two key limitations. The first is the launch vehicle mass. Given current launch vehicle technology, we can only get so much mass to a given asteroid and that limits the deliverable momentum, which can be a problem for large asteroids or even for smaller asteroids if the warning time is short. And secondly, sometimes, particularly for smaller asteroids, the needed delta V can exceed or become a significant fraction of the escape velocity of the body. And so you risk imparting an unintentional disruption. We talked a little bit about this yesterday in the context of the PDC exercise, and that weakly, dispersed, uh, weakly disrupted object is, is a non-ideal um, outcome. Standoff nuclear explosion can address both of these issues. First, uh, a readily available technology can handle anything up to a kilometer class asteroid. And secondly, if we're worried about accidentally disrupting the asteroid, another option is to purposefully disrupt it, uh, source in a lot of energy, and totally shred it into many, many small fragments that are well dispersed and would miss the Earth. As a motivating example, I'll talk about the PDC scenario. And uh, uh, what was on the web as of last week was a range of 100 meter to 250 meters in diameter and about 10 years warning time. And typically, you need something on the order of a centimeter per second push when you have that much warning time. Uh, with what we know about these cases, for the smaller case, a kinetic impactor could handle it. It could give enough of a momentum delivery. You'd only need something on the order of 500 to 1,500 kilograms to deflect it. However, for that smaller size range, the escape velocity is something, might be something like four centimeters per second, and the needed delta V is already becoming a significant fraction of that. So we do worry about uh, unintentional disruption, maybe that's a risk we're willing to incur, but it's something to think about. And as you wait for the probability of impact to evolve over the coming years, that problem will get worse. For the 250 meter case, on the other hand, uh, kinetic uh, cannot, uh, likely cannot handle that at all. Uh, it would require something on the order of 20 metric tons to deflect an asteroid of that size. And so right off the bat, you'd want to think about some other options. And a nuclear disruption or deflection can handle either of these uh, end member cases, which I'll show in a minute here. Uh, modeling uh, the deflection of an asteroid using a standoff nuclear explosion is very challenging because you need to have very high resolution at the surface during early times to capture the blow off, um, which you can see schematically here. We're looking at velocities at early times. To resolve the X ray deposition correctly and capture all the material that's being vaporized at these early times needs something like 10 micron resolution. And this phase finishes evolving um, by a millisecond or so, or a few hundred microseconds typically. But then you also want to be able to track the asteroid's response at later times and see how much material is being dislodged or broken up or ejected or if there's spallation. Um, and that's over much larger uh, distance scales and, and longer time scales. Um, typically a second or multiple um, sound crossing times. And so our strategy to handle both uh, phases of the problem 
is to have a special node generator, which you can read more about uh, in Mike Owen's 2015 HVIS contribution. Uh, this node generator works by having very fine resolution in the radial direction, 10 microns, but in the tangential direction, it's, it's much larger to cover the whole surface of the asteroid. It's something like a meter resolution. And so the, the particles themselves look like large plates. And that allows us to both capture energy deposition correctly and, and also model the entire problem. Um, we, co we composite that special node generator with the coarser distribution of particles in the rest of the asteroid. You can see here the colors are indicating the masses of the particles themselves. So red is more massive, blue is uh, very tiny. And so you can track then the shock propagation through the rest of the asteroid using this method. Uh, the code that we use for these simu simulations is called Spheral. Uh, Spheral is an open source, adaptive, smooth particle hydrodynamics code. Uh, the adaptive part is very essential here because it allows resolution to vary with direction, which is essential for, uh, as I just noted, for that special node generator. Um, and you can talk more uh, to Mike Owen if you want to talk more about this later, but um, it uh, has a lot of different material models that are available. Um, a damage model is a generalized uh, form, a tensor form of the uh, a Benz Asphog model. Here we have our initial conditions. We're using the Bennu shape model, which is from uh, 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 radar observations by Nolan et al. in 2013. On the left, you can see the original shape model um, with somewhat coarser facets, and you can see that that affects the energy deposition so it's not quite as smooth as we would like. And so to make a more realistic looking energy deposition and shock propagation, we go ahead and smooth those triangular facets twice and you get the um, result on the right. That's what energy deposition looks like when it's smooth. And uh, then we can have more, more realistic looking shock. That's more what a, of a real asteroid shape would probably look like. Um, now this is a half-scale Bennu. Bennu itself is about 500 meters across. We've scaled it down to represent uh, a PDC scenario type object. And uh, part of the motivation for using a real shape model is that the delta V that you get from any of these deflections is going to be a vector quantity. Um, and so it, it, it's helpful to have realistic topography so you see how much of the deflection is the, in the intended direction and how much is in some of the other directions. It's always going to be some 3D uh, push. One of the features of the nuclear deflection method is that as you pull away to farther standoff distances, you can dial down the delivered impulse, and that's shown here. Colors are showing the uh, blow-off velocity, so 10 kilometers per second is, is in red, and 10 centimeters per second is in blue. And we're going from on the far left to a proximity burst at uh, 10 meters off the surface of the asteroid, and then pulling back to 350 meters from the center and 500 meters from the center. And you see how an increasing fraction of the surface is affected by the X-ray deposition. That has the added benefit of averaging the impulse over a much larger topographic region so that you're not as sensitive to the local topography. Compare that with a kinetic impactor that might be a meter or so across and is very sensitive potentially to the local topography, whether there's a competent boulder or an oblique surface. Um, that's something you want to think about. What, what are the repercussions of that? Uh, and these are velocity magnitudes at about 300 microseconds. So that's, that's when the um, blow-off phase is, is mostly complete, generally. Now, those were a little bit um, harder pushes. Uh, for something that's 250 meters, you'd want a pretty gen gentle push more along these lines. So here we have deflection velocity versus standoff distance. And then the 100 kiloton yield case is shown in blue. And as you go to farther standoff distances, you can get softer pushes. The escape velocity is about up here. And you can see that that can um, reproduce some of the same types of pushes you would get from one standoff distance, but using smaller yields. So it's a very flexible method that you can dial in your intended impulse just by backing off. You don't need a, a large array of different yield devices. One, one device is very multi-purpose. Now after the blow-off's complete, we're really interested in seeing what happens to shock propagation in the rest of the asteroid. 
So here we're looking at two similar cases on the left, 25 kilotons, 500 meter standoff, then 100 kilotons, one kilometer standoff. These both give about two centimeter per second push. And here the, the bottom of the, of the velocity scale here is 10 centimeters per second, so that's about the escape speed of the asteroid. And you can barely see material, there's a small annulus here barely visible that's moving that fast. So most of the asteroid is, is, is moving, is, has been very gently pushed. There's not a lot of material that's moving in a way that we're worrying about additional disruption or fragmentation. You have to stretch the velocity scale bar down to a centimeter per second down here to really see that material that's, that's uh, moving slowly behind the pressure wave here. And another option, uh, for particularly for small things, this is a, a Bennu uh, shape scaled down to 100 meter diameter, is an intentional disruption. So this is a megaton yield device uh, deployed about 10 meters off the surface. And we can see the, the velocities at which this thing is being ripped apart. Um, red is 10 kilometers per second. And so it's, it's being very robustly uh, ripped apart. What that looks like more quantitatively is shown here. These are the magnitudes of the different velocity components for both the bound and escape material from that last simulation we saw. So the green is in the uh, y direction, which is the direction of uh, major direction of push. And so uh, for the escaped and dotted and the, and the bound and, and solid, these are all within tens to hundreds of meters per second velocities, so they're very well dispersed on average and uh, should pose no risk to the Earth, uh, even at fairly short warning times. This stuff would be pushed out of the way and miss the Earth. But just to summarize, we now have the capability to model high-resolution blow-off and large-scale breakup in the same integrated uh, simulation. Uh, nuclear methods can robustly deflect or disrupt the PDC scenario object for the whole range of possible sizes. We assess both delta V from blow-off and the subsequent uh, bulk disturbance. Standoff distance can be easily varied for dial push results, and disruption when needed is, is also modeled. Ongoing development that's important for this project is damage tracking to later times, um, tracking the the fragments at the end of the disruption um, using n-body codes, and we can do that within Spheral itself or use other orbital mechanics codes. And finally, uh, we're very interested in rubble pile behavior, what happens when you incorporate more realistic structures into asteroids, and Mike Owen has a really interesting talk on that tomorrow. And we're always working on additional experimental validation um, and uh, Tanay Remington is going to be talking about comparisons with experiments to, to really tune our ma material models to be as precise as possible. So thank you. I'll take any questions. Thanks. Those are spectacular simulations. But I have to ask you the question I always ask at this time. Do you really have confidence you could time the explosion in a way to get the standoff distance you wanted and to achieve the results that are shown here? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It's, it's a little bit out of my jurisdiction. Um, uh, I, I do have confidence in the engineers that are responsible for that aspect of the problem, though. Um, and, I, and I know that that's an ongoing discussion as, as part of our our collaboration with Goddard Space Flight Center actually talking about um, for different standoff distances, what is the sensitivity to, to um, the timing and, and how, how, how are we prepared for, for that um, aspect of the problem, so. And as a quick follow-up, <clears throat> Dave, I can, I can speak to what Megan was just talking about and we do have confidence that we can achieve the necessary timing for the rendezvous case and the hypervelocity intercept cases are being analyzed as we speak. Um, hypervelocity, I was worried about. Yes, I, I presumed. So we are analyzing that, and the, the early results look promising. Any other questions for Megan? Okay, we have a question in the back, top row. Hi, Megan. Um, Bennu has peaks and valleys and various other things, and likely have craters and, and boulders and other things like that. 
Uh, I know what your model is, obviously, but the, uh, the question is, have you run more than one face through your, um, through your model just to see whether or not it makes any difference whatsoever? I mean, I'm, I'm really curious of what the scale of terrain, it, what scale of terrain variation is necessary in order to get significant differences in the results? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, I've, I've, I've looked at that for kinetic impactors, the sensitivity to different uh, impact locations on a shape model, but I haven't done it for, for nuclear ablation, and so it's, it would be nice to do a suite of, of simulations for that. Thank you. That Okay, this is an excellent discussion, but unfortunately we'll have to hold the remaining questions for um, offline times during the breaks and such. Let's thank our speaker. Okay, up next we have Bob Weaver from the Integrated Design Group at Los Alamos National Laboratory. We'll be queuing up his talk. He'll be providing an overview of Los Alamos projects supporting planetary defense. Bob, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brent. Um, I, th I want to congratulate uh, Megan on a very good introduction to uh, nuclear ablation uh, techniques. Uh, I want, I'm representing the team at Los Alamos, uh, which is re represented by my co-authors here, Galen Gissler, who has a talk on Thursday morning about uh, deep water impact, uh, Kathy Plesko, who has a poster um, uh, next door uh, on the challenges uh, faced uh, in actually fielding a nuclear mission that address parts of the issues of timing and fusing, um, as well as other things. Um, and Tamara Hebling, who's a postdoc that has joined our team and uh, was not able to make the uh, trip out here. Uh, so today I want to talk about two specific objects in the short amount of time we have left. Um, and that is a quick overview of some of the projects that are going on at Los Alamos. Uh, and then uh, a, much, a little bit deeper dive into uh, the Los Alamos techniques for doing nuclear ablation. So um, Los Alamos is an integral part of uh, inter interagency agreement that we have in place uh, between uh, NASA and uh, the National Nuclear Security Agency uh, under DOE. Uh, and we are working together to detect and mitigate uh, impact threats uh, from potentially ha hazardous objects. Um, and uh, it's well known that uh, NSA is one of the federal agencies uh, that does have responsibility for planetary defense. Uh, and the three labs uh, uh, that are associated with this effort are Los Alamos, Sandia, and Livermore. Uh, and I'll be speaking to the Los Alamos activities. So this slide addresses the current work that's going on at Los Alamos. Uh, where there's a various uh, series of case studies that uh, are part of the tasking that we have in the interagency agreement. Uh, case study one uh, is a standoff nuclear burst on a Bennu class asteroid. Uh, I'll be showing some simulations of that uh, further on in this, in this talk. Um, case study two is a kinetic impactor on the Diddy moon. Uh, we have uh, initial calculations. We have a shape model from Goddard, and we have initial calculations that are going uh, ongoing for that. Um, uh, and case study three uh, is one of the most challenging ones. Uh, it's a scaled down version of a very complex object. Uh, and uh, whether, uh, whether it breaks up, whether it, it that depends on which side you hit it on, um, it will be very interesting to explore. Uh, we have not yet started on this work yet. Um, for impact uh, consequences, there's work going on on that. Uh, see Gail and Gissler's presentation uh, that I mentioned on Thursday morning. Uh, the question that's being addressed there is if an asteroid uh, impacts in deep ocean, uh, what is the threat of tsunamis? 
Um, and I'm performing uh, calculations of actual nuclear sources. Uh, the, th the three laboratories that I mentioned are the places that th this can be done, uh, where we're actually using actual nuclear explosives uh, and including X-ray, neutron, and gamma outputs. Uh, and then uh, the goal of that work is to actually compare uh, a, uh, a classified source to the unclassified sources I'm going to show you today in the integrated quantity of how much a, of a push do we give to an asteroid. So for case study one, the rest of this talk will be talking about the calculations we're doing at Los Alamos for case study one. Uh, it's uh, in reference to a design reference uh, asteroid one, which is Bennu. Uh, we have, make, have to make some simplifications. Um, we run this in 2D, so we use a spherical uh, case. Uh, Dave Dearborn and I agreed that uh, we would use a one megaton source at a height of burst of 100 meters. Um, in addition to the 100 meter case that was uh, the agreed upon uh, uh, height of burst, uh, we performed calculations at two other heights of burst, 25 meters and 50 meters. Uh, the asteroid is modeled as a 500 meter diameter sphere uh, of density one uh, with dry silicon dioxide and a, a homogeneous submesh porosity of uh, uh, getting it down to one gram per cc. Uh, the source model uh, is unclassified, obviously, uh, and is a uniform sphere that's initialized with one megaton of energy. Um, that was a constraint uh, that we agreed upon. Uh, one megaton of energy and its size, such as the surface temperature of the asteroid, uh, of the source, is uh, two kilovolts. Um, subsequent evolution of this source is calculated by a radiation hydrodynamics code at Los Alamos. Uh, and uh, the Los Alamos team believes this model uh, of the source and the interaction with the asteroid uh, is a very realistic uh, characterization of a real nuclear explosion. Um, I've been working on uh, X-ray deposition from nuclear weapons since uh, the 1980s. Uh, and over the years, we've learned that we need to use X-ray transport. Uh, to properly assess the amount of flux that's actually, X-ray flux that's absorbed by the uh, asteroid and then re-emitted by the asteroid. The, the asteroid surface gets very hot, uh, upwards of a kilovolt in some cases. Well, in these, at these standoff distances, I'll show you what the temperatures are. Uh, but it's hot enough to re-radiate, and the, the actual absorbed energy is the difference between a large amount of incoming flux and a large amount of re-radiated flux. <clears throat> so here's uh, a step through st the calculation that we did at 100 meters. Uh, the X-ray emission uh, uh, from the uh, source uh, uh, reaches the asteroid at the speed of light. Um, the uh, source then expand, uh, the explodes, expands, uh, and cools naturally due to the radiation that it's giving off as well as the expansion. Uh, and the evolution of the source, source spectrum uh, is naturally cooling as the, uh, as the surface temperature cools. Um, so that, that plot on the right over here is an example starting off at 2 kilovolts. Uh, this goes out to 10 microseconds. Uh, so you can see an evolution of the cooling of the uh, source temperature down to about 100 EV uh, by 10 microseconds. If we look at what happens at the actual asteroid itself, uh, it absorbs energy. These are the three heights of burst that we considered. The blue curve here is the case of interest that we agreed upon, the 100 meter height of burst. Uh, and that, uh, in that case, uh, the difference between the absorbed energy and the re-radiated energy results in about 50 kilotons of energy remaining in the asteroid uh, that gives this pressure wave uh, that uh, moves through the asteroid and, um, and continues to uh, do, a, blaze, do uh, a push to the asteroid. If we look at the surface temperature of the asteroid, these are the three, three cases. The, uh, the lowest one, obviously, in blue, is a 100 meter case. Uh, the peak temperature uh, just after radiation of the surface is about 60 EV. 
for those that, this is our language, uh, for those that don't speak our language, 1 EV is about 11,000 degrees Kelvin. Um, and so this is a very hot surface. Uh, and then it cools off slowly down to about 20, 20 EV. And so all of this interaction is captured by the radiation hydrodynamics code that we're using. Uh, if you go down to 25 meters, the peak temperature is up around 160 EV. Uh, and so that's uh, quite, quite a bit hotter. Um, this is the interesting part. What we calculate is the amount of uh, asteroid material that's ablated off the surface. Uh, and then we integrate that as a function of time. Um, and for the three different heights of burst, uh, this is uh, the, the blue, or the red curve here is, I changed color, sorry. The red curve now is 100 meter height of burst. Uh, and there's a peak in these curves because as the ex uh, source expands, we actually have the source, a source in the calculation. As the source expands, it eventually reaches the surface of the asteroid and suppresses further ablation at that point. And so I take the peak uh, uh, momentum, momentum uh, that's ablated in the uh, positive Y direction. Uh, and from that, we obtain uh, the actual uh, uh, imparted velocities. At 100 meter height of burst, uh, we calculate that it's a 1.6 centimeter push. Uh, and there seems to be a, a, a preferred uh, peak, uh, pr uh, most uh, uh, best uh, height of burst. And that's about 50 meters and gives a push of about 2.2 uh, centimeters per second. So in summary, um, We've used the radiation hydrodynamics uh, code for full X-ray transport. We think that's important to actually capture properly the interaction of the X-rays uh, absorbed and re-emitted from the asteroid. Uh, our source model accurately represents uh, uh, an unclassified nuclear explosion. Uh, and then the uh, uh, subsequent radiation from that uh, as, uh, source and cooling uh, that we would expect from any uh, nuclear source. Um, the total energy retained by the asteroid uh, varies from about 50 kilotons to 80 kilotons. Uh, and that's in this hot surface that, that uh, causes the ablation. Um, and the rapidly expanding source actually suppresses further rate, uh, ablation after it interacts with the surface of, of the asteroid. Um, so the, the, the bottom line for case study one for us for this interagency agreement is uh, Los Alamos calculates a 1.6 centimeter push for a, a 500 meter diameter uh, object with an energy of one megaton. And these are pictures from the simulation. There's a sor expanding source, the initial ablation of the uh, asteroid material, the source expanding even further, further ablation, and then when the source actually interacts with the ablating material, it's pushing back on, on that and suppresses further radiation. And with that, I'd t I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Bob. Uh, we have a question over here to my left, top. Here comes the microphone. Hi, uh, I'm up here to your left, over here. Uh, uh, so I was just curious, are you like, have you considered like the amount of energy you're putting in to ablate the surface? It's like going into like a superheating state where you're like putting more energy than you actually need into like the ablation process. So have you considered like how much energy you are wasting in that like superheating? I'm, I, I don't quite understand what you mean by superheating. Uh, as Megan explained, we can uh, dial the height of burst on these to achieve the effects that we want. Um, and the radiation hydro, hydro codes accurately calculate how much uh, energy is absorbed and how much is re-emitted. Um, and uh, that balance is, is what is, is giving the asteroid the push. We have time for one more brief question. Ah. Uh, in Frascati, uh, it was presented uh, another approach that you and Megan just uh, talking about the positive HOB. Uh, it was introduced the um, a high uh, velocity inter intercept asteroid which 
is combination of the nuclear and also in the kinetic. The kinetic uh, was located on the yes. some yes. kind of uh, astromast yes. boom, yes. and uh, uh, then you have the buried. It, it means that efficiency is at least twice higher than the uh, of uh, stand uh, explosion, and the mass sh could be lower. What are your comments on, on this idea? So there's been a design uh, review uh, to, uh, to modify the spacecraft that, that we uh, were working on. Uh, that was called a high V uh, spacecraft and had a impactor that created a crater and um, uh, uh, the nuclear explosive would go off in that crater, enhancing the coupling. Uh, that's been redesigned into what we call HAMMER now, and I forget what HAMMER stands mm. for. Hypervelocity Asteroid Mitigation Mission for Emergency Response. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> um, and the HAMMER design do, is not con uh, conducive to actually uh, the, uh, the, the bays for where you might put either a kinetic impactor or a nuclear explosive are offset from the center, and so it's not conducive to actually creating a crater and doing the same thing as, as we were studying two years ago. Okay. So, so um, the intent of the hammer design is really to do a standoff nuclear burst. Okay, <clears throat> thanks very much. Let's thank our speaker. Our next speaker is John Brophy from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, who's going to be talking to us about um, ion beam deflection of asteroids in the context of our 2017 PDC scenario. John? All right, thank you. Uh, we're going to talk about something much gentler, definitely not a hammer. Uh, when we look at uh, what does it take, uh, what kind of characteristics do you need in a high power SEP vehicle in order to do an ion beam deflection? of our uh, hypothetical threat object. So just to orient you, um, here's a, a figure that I ripped off from Bombardelli's 2011 paper on the ion beam shepherd, because I was too lazy to recreate it. But it gives you uh, basically the, the configuration of this uh, ion beam deflection approach, where you have a spacecraft that fires uh, a beam of ions uh, into the asteroid transferring the momentum of the, of the ions into the asteroid through inelastic collisions. And then, of course, you have to thrust in the opposite direction in order to uh, station keep with the object. So uh, you can think of the ions as uh, kinetic impactors. And if you love kinetic impactors, then instead of having one or maybe a handful of kinetic impactors, uh, in this case, we have 5 times 10 to the 27th kinetic impactors. Uh, the, advantage of this approach, um, one of the advantages of this approach, is we can impact the ions at a much higher speed than a typical kinetic impactor. So instead of around 10 or maybe even 15 kilometers per second, uh, these ions will impact the asteroid, in this example, uh, about around 70 kilometers per second. So that's one advantage. The other advantage is you can direct that momentum uh, in the most optimum direction. And because you're rendezvousing with the asteroid, you can figure out, uh, as Paul showed yesterday, whether you have, in which direction you need to push the, uh, the impact point off the Earth. And so you can choose the shortest uh, path to do that. In order to do this, you need some characteristics from your uh, ion beam deflection system. And principally, what you want to do is be able to stand the spacecraft off from the asteroid surface uh, a fairly large distance, on the order of uh, 700 to maybe 1,000 meters. And in order to do that, you need to have a beam divergence angle from the propulsion system uh, that's small, that's single-digit uh, degrees uh, for that half angle. And if you do that, uh, so we show three examples here of uh, 2, 3, and 4 degrees. Uh, in this paper, we assumed that the beam divergence angle was about 4 degrees, um, but we have um, ion optics codes that suggest that we could cut that down to between two and, and three degrees. Um, the, nice, uh, the other advantage of this approach is that it is almost completely independent of the characteristics of the threat object. Obviously, it depends on the mass, uh, but it doesn't depend on the density or the surface characteristics or how rapidly it's spinning. 
Uh, and so the amount of force that you can apply to the asteroid is entirely within your engineering control. So how much force you apply and how much propellant it takes, that's stuff that we can engineer uh, into the system. We happen to have uh, a nearly perfect uh, ion thruster that was developed for the Jupiter Icy Moons Orbiter mission uh, nearly a decade ago now. Uh, the thruster is called Nexus. It operates at uh, 20, uh, up to 20 kilowatts, produces a specific impulse of 7,000 seconds. So that's the 70 kilometers uh, per second uh, uh, ion speed. And uh, here's an example of the uh, thruster running. It had flat carbon-carbon grids. And in this case, it produced a, uh, an ion beam uh, uh, expansion angle of about six degrees. They weren't trying to get to a, a low beam divergence angle. They didn't care about that. They kind of got this uh, by, it was just fortuitous. But we can design this uh, to cut that angle down to about two and a half degrees or, or three, something like that. All right, so now, to get to the asteroid to deflect it, you want to be able to use all of the available power to transfer the vehicle to the asteroid and then use all the available power to deflect it. The reason you want to use all the available power to get there is because you have to, you want to maximize the amount of time that you have available for the deflection. So you got to go as fast as you can. So we have a couple of cartoons here. To get, to do the heliocentric uh, rendezvous phase, we orient the thrusters so they're all pointing in the same direction. We use all the available power. Uh, we get there as fast as we can. And once you get there, then uh, we have a mechanism. Uh, the concept would be to have a mechanism that rotates the thrusters by 90 degrees. Then you rotate the spacecraft about this axis and rotate the arrays. You can reconfigure the spacecraft like that so you can thrust half uh, in each direction. Um, all right, and so again, we have the 7,000 second uh, thrusters. So how long does it take to get there? In this study, we assumed that it would take us four years to build a vehicle. So we assumed six months for phase A, six months for phase B, and three years for uh, CD. And so we would launch uh, four years from now, in May 2021. And if you do that, uh, so we estimated the mass of the vehicle. Uh, we did that based on the, uh, mass, the very detailed mass estimates we had from the uh, asteroid redirect rendezvous, asteroid whatever, the, our mission. <laughs> we have a very good idea what those masses were. We took off the capture mechanism, replaced it with more power and propulsion. Um, and we came up with, coincidentally, about 10 metric tons. So we launched our 10 metric tons on a Falcon Heavy-like launch vehicle to a small positive uh, uh, C3. And if we do that, um, we find that it takes about a little over two and a half years to get there. So now we've used up four years for the vehicle development, uh, 2.6 years to get there, leaving about 3.6 years left for the deflection. The problem with this uh, threat object, of course, is it's on an elliptical trajectory, and so it goes slightly uh, inboard of 0.9 AU and out to 3.6 AU. It's a solar-powered vehicle. It's got to follow that power. We assume that it did that at, uh, as 1 over R squared. It's a little bit conservative, but uh, not too much. And then to make the system easier to build, we clipped the power. Uh, when we're inside 1 AU, we clipped it at the peak power that we can process. And when we're beyond about 3 AU, if we don't have uh, at least 20 kilowatts, then we uh, clipped it uh, and, and did not allow the system to run below 20 kilowatts. This is an example for 160 kilowatt, a total power uh, vehicle. And you can see, uh, so this is the uh, solar range for the asteroid as a function of time before impact. And this is how much power we would have uh, clipping it at 160 kilowatts and not thrusting below 20 kilowatts. 3.6 years is when we can start thrusting because that's when we get there. So we're actually only, only deflecting the asteroid over this part and then this uh, thrust arc there. This one turns out not to do you much good. Almost all the deflection comes from that part of the, the orbit. So this is what it looks like. This is the uh, deflection in the zeta direction on the 2027 B plane. If you remember what Paul told us yesterday, uh, so that's the deflection on the impact plane in 2027. And uh, Paul was nice enough to give us the partial derivatives of the, that uh, change in that, um, 
that deflection as a function of uh, how much force you apply at any point in the asteroid's trajectory uh, from now until uh, the time it would impact. And so what we did is we took wherever uh, solar range we were at, we figured out how much power we had, calculated how much thrust we had for that day, determined the deflection, and then added those all up for the amount of time that we had to deflect it. And that's what these are. So, for example, if we could start thrusting right now for this, say, this yellow curve, it's a 250 meter, 2 gram per cc asteroid, if we could start thrusting now, we could deflect it. But we don't have 10 years because we've got to build the spacecraft, we've got to get it there. We only have 3.6 years. So that means uh, for a 100 meter, 2 gram per cc asteroid, we can actually deflect that by about 2.5 Earth radii. And uh, so that's, that's not too bad. And a 150 meter asteroid, we're just under one meter. If this were 140 meters in diameter, we could deflect it by one Earth radii. I mean. So, okay, um, the interesting thing is how steep this curve is. We can go from two and a half Earth radii to one, so we'd have deflected it by one and a half Earth radii in only a couple of months. So it's not a, uh, it's not, you don't have to thrust for years to do this deflection for the smaller sized asteroids. The other thing is, okay, you may say, all right, what are you smoking? We can't build a 160 kilowatt SCP vehicle. I think we probably can, but it doesn't really matter because we could, we know very well how to actually build a half of that, an 80 kilowatt vehicle. We know that because we've seen detailed uh, spacecraft designs from a variety of contractors, and we know that that could easily be scaled to uh, 80 kilowatts, so you could fly two of those. That actually would give you a more robust approach for the deflection anyway, because one of those at 80 kilowatts would be good enough to deflect that smaller asteroid. Two of them would provide you the operational robustness that you might need. All right, so how much propellant, though, does it take? So here's the amount of propellant for our 160 kilowatt IBD vehicle, uh, 3.6 years, uh, so it takes a little over uh, 1,200 kilograms of xenon. That's not too bad. In fact, it took us more xenon to get to the asteroid than it does to actually deflect it. And uh, just as a way of comparison to the standard gravity tractor, because I'm running out of time here, so here's the force that you get uh, for a standard gravity tractor, assuming a seven-ton vehicle at the asteroid for these three, four different asteroid sizes, and we limit the altitude to one uh, asteroid radius, and we compare that to the force you get from this 160 kilowatt IBD vehicle, and basically it's an order of magnitude greater, uh, which is why this is possible. So uh, since I'm just about out of time, I am going to switch ahead to the, to the end, which says, this is an approach that is uh, very well suited for asteroids in the smaller size. So if you're 50 to maybe 150 meter diameter object, this ion beam deflection at these power levels uh, is very well suited for uh, the deflection of that, uh, those size objects, and you don't have to thrust for years in order to, de to deflect them. Thank you very much. Okay, questions. We have a question here in the center, second row. Microphone's on its way. Thank you. Uh, what happens to the ion beam as it interacts with the uh, solar uh, plasma? Okay, so uh, so the, the ion beam is um, uh, you know much more dense than the solar uh, solar wind, and so uh, for over this distance, we're you know we're talking about you know several hundred meters to maybe a thousand meters. Um, there we we would just overwhelm the the solar wind because it's much more, it's a much more dense plasma. Um, and I should point out that it also doesn't affect the surface of the asteroid because the pressure that we'd apply is well, is order, a couple of orders of magnitude below even the six pascals that we heard earlier today. And you can't heat the surface because we're spreading the beam out over the whole asteroid. Um, Are these ions um, still electrified? Or do they have a net charge or not? So these are still ions. The beam is neutralized, so it's, it's quasi-neutral. So there's the same number of electrons as I, and ions in the beam propagating away from the spacecraft. It just seems that there would be some retarding forces 
that would tend to slow down the ions. Um, maybe we should talk afterwards because... Okay. Excellent. Okay, let's thank our speaker. Our next speaker is Mr. Uh, Kikuchi uh, from the University of Tokyo, Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Uh, he's a PhD student uh, there, and his research interests are primarily in astrodynamics, um, in particular dynamics around asteroids. Um, he's been working on several deep space projects for JAXA, including Hayabusa 2 um, and the Solar Sail Ikaros mission. So, Mr. Kikuchi, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Today, um, I'm going to talk about a novel asteroid spin and deflection strategy using a solar sail spacecraft. So I would like to share our very first idea and um, our very first analysis result with everyone today. Now, key technologies in this study are solar cell and reflectivity control device. So let me begin with the quick overview of these technologies. A solar cell is a form of um, space, spacecraft propulsion using solar radiation pressure acting on a cell membrane. JAXA um, launched the solar, space, solar cell spacecraft Icolos in 2010, and it successfully demonstrated the deployment of 14 meter square cell membrane, and it also demonstrated the propulsion using solar radiation pressure. And after the success of this Icarus mission, JAXA is currently developing a um, solar power cell spacecraft for Jupiter Trojan asteroid sample return mission. And this spacecraft is scheduled to be launched in early 2020s, and it has a huge membrane with the side length of about 50 meter. So this, um, this spacecraft has a huge membrane to generate the solar power, to, to generate the large solar power even at the Jupiter distance. And another um, key technology that is demonstrated in the Ecolos mission is the attitude control by using reflectivity control devices. A reflectivity control device is a thin film um, flexible sheet that can change its optical property by inducing the electrical voltage. So when the power is off, it has um, this kind of dull whitish color. By contrast, when the power is on, it has specular um, color. So this figure shows the um, solar cell spacecraft mounting reflectivity control devices on its membrane. So when the surface is exposed to disorientation, this on-state reflectivity control device shows specular reflection, while this off-state re reflectivity control device exhibits diffuse reflection. So the difference in um, so this difference in reflectivity induces this imbalance in the SRP force. So it generates the SRP torque like this. So it can control, RCD can control the attitude of a spacecraft without using, without requiring any fuel or um, like mechanical devices. So the idea is that if a spacecraft is attached to the surface of an asteroid like this, and it uses reflectivity control devices, it can despin an asteroid by generating SRP torque like this. So once an asteroid is despin, it can ensure the um, effective deflection operation because, for example, um, when an asteroid is not spinning, it is much easier to predict the dynamics of like impact events or um, ablation. And if an asteroid is very small, it can also be directly captured, like um, asteroid retrieval mission. And another important idea here 
is that this attached solar cell can also be used to deflect the trajectory of an asteroid by um, leveraging the solar radiation pressure acting on this cell membrane. So these are main ideas of this in this study, asteroid spin and asteroid deflection. So the advantages of this method is, first of all, it is, of course, fuel-free, and um, it uses continuous torque or continuous acceleration, so it does not involve impulsive event or impact event. And the dynamic itself is less dependent on asteroid properties because um, basically this method uses the solar radiation pressure, for pressure force acting on a cell membrane. And um, these methods are based on technology that I've already demonstrated in space, as I mentioned before. So the proposed method is um, reliable and low cost um, method to do um, asteroid spin or asteroid deflection. So let me begin with the uh, asteroid spin part. Now this figure shows the despin mechanism using reflectivity control devices. So once um, a solar cell is attached on the surface of an asteroid, it can control the spin rate of an asteroid uh, by using reflectivity control devices. And moreover, um, our research group have recently developed an advanced RCD that can reflect a light diagonally, and I won't explain it in detail, but the point is this advanced RCD can generate the SRP torque about this normal direction. So it acts as a windmill in this case. So as a result, um, three-axis attitude control can be achieved by using both conventional reflectivity control devices and advanced RCDs. So this means that this, this spin um, strategy can be applicable to arbitrary spinning direction. So um, this equation gives the change in spin rate of, um, of an asteroid. This T is SRP torque, and it is averaged over um, one rotation period. And again, um, the explicit form of solar radiation pressure torque can be found in our paper, but the point is this SRP torque is proportional to the cube of the cell length L. And the moment of inertia I is proportional to the uh, fifth po power of the asteroid diameter D. So this delta omega value can be expressed as a counter map like this. Horizontal axis is sail length, and vertical axis is asteroid diameter. Now, this method is applicable to um, relatively small asteroids, like less than several hundred meters. So the, uh, the range of this diameter is 10 to 200 meters in this figure. And um, the time duration is given as two years in this case. Well, so let me give you some examples. Um, assuming a 55 meter cell is our current technology, it can spin a 30-meter asteroid by two RPD. So it um, almost corresponds to the rotation period of about 10 hours. And of course, when the cell gets larger, it can, all, it can spin the much larger asteroid. For example, 300-meter cell can uh, spin the 100-meter asteroid by one RPD. And as you may know, um, small ast smaller asteroid tends to have um, faster spin, spin rate, and this method is applicable to that, ty that type of an asteroid as well, as shown in this case. So, of course, solar radiation pressure is very weak in general, but if an, a solar cell has larger arm length, then it can leverage that weak solar radiation pressure force to generate the large uh, solar radiation pressure torque. So that's the main point of this um, asteroid spin method. 
So far, I've, I've explained the astray dispin strategy, and from here, I would like to talk about astray deflection strategy. So this one is, um, shows the astray trajectory that is used in this study. This one is expressed in the inertia frame, and this one is expressed in the rotating frame. Now, it is almost like um, apophis trajectory, but the orbital elements are slightly modified so that it actually impacts to the Earth. So I guess it's important to emphasize that it is a hypothetical asteroid. So, so um, we use this trajectory to evaluate the asteroid deflection performance. And these are some simulation results for uh, two different sets of asteroid and sail parameters. This blue one is the original impact trajectory, and this uh, black line it corresponds to the um, GEO altitude. And these red lines uh, shows the deflected trajectories for different um, time durations. So 10 years means it, this um, asteroid trajectory is deflected by solar radiation pressure for 10 years. So you can see that this um, asteroid deflection deflection method is effective to some extent if we choose the proper cell length. So, um, okay, so in all of the analysis I showed you in this presentation, I assume that um, the surface is fully um, covered with R RCDs, but this is not necessarily favorable because this model has less um, deflection performance compared with this kind of specular surface. So there should be some kind of um, optimized um, design which have, which both, which have um, both RCDs and specular surfaces. And this is the last slide, and this shows the quick uh, mass calculation. So this counter map shows the sail mass, including both base film and RCDs. Horizontal axis indicates the sail length, and vertical axis indicates the RCD ratio. So for example, 100 meter sail with 40% uh, RCD ratio has a mass of about 500 kilograms, and um, when the sail length is 300 meter, it, the mass is about eight to nine ton. And of course, it's not that light, but at least I could say that it is um, pretty reasonable considering the importance of the task we have to achieve. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you everyone for kind attention. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we have time for one brief question. Okay. Top row. I love the technology you're talking about, and I think it's going to be very useful for a lot of spacecraft and, and um, solar system exploration type things. Thank you. I do have a problem with applying it to this problem. Um, let's say that you have a 100-meter asteroid, a 300-meter sail. Uh, the 100 meter asteroid is spinning at roughly breakup, so it's spinning very fast. The two questions are, how do you attach the sail to the spinning asteroid, and how do you keep the torque from that immediate grab from ripping your sails apart? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I must admit that there are a lot of things to be considered uh, for this method, and I haven't considered that kind of things, but um, of course, a spacecraft must like anchor to the asteroid, so we have to analyze that thing. And another thing that is related to, I guess, your question is that um, it also uh, the the cell itself also has to have some sort of like boom to um, extend keep to to maintain the um, cell extension. So. The kind of like structure thing, including um, that anchoring point and um, and also the sail part is, I guess, our um, the next step to be analyzed. 
Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Our next presentation is by Professor Bong Wee of the Asteroid Deflection Research Center at Iowa State University. We'll be talking about uh, a multiple kinetic energy impactor vehicle mission concept for small asteroid disruption. Testing. Testing. Okay. Good afternoon. As you can see from this uh, first page, I will be talking about the use of kinetic energy impactor. Uh, exploiting is hypervelocity, very high kinetic energy level, not as linear momentum transfer. Okay, so. So I will very briefly review the high uh, I don't see the screen here. Oh, I see, okay. So high B concept is basically uh, utilizing the nuclear subsurface explosion to improve the coupling efficiency. And we present this one through our NIAC study during the last uh, past three years. And then one major critique we receive is the use of nuclear device at that time frame. But nowadays, I think m most of you accept the use of nuclear device. But around that time frame, when we were studying, whoops, <laughs> there was no such case. So we developed the use of nuclear device, but we got that kind of critique. Then we spent another two or three years to develop non-nuclear options to compete against such a highly powerful nuclear device. So I'm going to present very brief results uh, for using that. And then we have a three different topic to the hydrodynamic simulation by uh, Ben Zimmerman, he has a PhD student who just uh, graduated, and also multiple target terminal intercept guidance, and then finally the use of heavy lift launch vehicle. Nuclear device doesn't require such a heavy lift vehicle, but if you do not allow for someone to use that, then we have to use heavy lift launch vehicle. So this is an outline of our high beam concept. I just want to re-emphasize that nuclear device nowadays, because of the contribution made by your organization, is very lightweight. So one megaton can be easily launched to interplanetary intercept orbit using conventional uh, Delta II class or even Delta IV heavy. So at the beginning of our NASA study, we developed our own uh, SPH concept to really see the effect of uh, combination of initial kinetic impact and follow-up of sub-sub explosion of nuclear device. My comment on this kind of results is I was not able to get what is the minimum size of each fragment. <laughs> this is more like a fluid simulation. So I hope some of you will be able to tell me or someone else what is the disruption result. It's one meter or 10 meter size or really vaporization or pulverization. I couldn't get the answer from my PhD students because of their uh, academic deficiency. <laughs> so this is the summary of our concept. Basically, x-axis, y-axis, you saw this one many times. X-axis is a warning time or time to impact or mission lead time. Y-axis is a size. Then I want to add upper x-axis. If the warning time is less than two, three years, we don't have much time to design, build, and launch the, the system should have been pre-deployed if someone wants to use that system. So we developed the concept of disruption, and then there is a well-known use of nuclear standoff, kinetic impactor, and gravity tractor for gentle deflections. We really focus on this negative x-axis. Not many people really talked about, because negative x is not really negative, but warning time is less than one year. What can we do? And those three dots 
is what happened during the last maybe three, four years. 2012 DA14 and Chelyabinsky van and another 2014 RC with I think it's one week notice. One week notice. Can we do something? But again, as I emphasize, when mission lead time is less than three years, aerospace industry will not be able to deliver the missions because of kind of time requirements. Again, you can see that the mission warning time is like that. If you limit to 10 years, unfortunately, we have to, from my perspective, I'm not choosing kinetic impactor or low energy gravity tractor. Nuclear standoff is more robust because it has a variable output. It has uh, many other system level advantage. However, when we talked about the use of nuclear device for such a very short warning time, and a lot of people got scared <laughs> because this is a worst last minute option. If, if it's not allowed to do anything, then let's don't do it. <laughs> Just get a hit by 50 meter or 100 meter single hit. But if you want to accept 1,000 Chelyabinsky van instead of single 50 or 150 meter impact, then we do have technology to be used to avoid that kind of single impact. However, again, the system should have been pre-deployed like conventional ICBM. So now we are talking about totally scary uh, topic. So this is another summary. So during, during, uh, during our three-year project, we heard about, I think it was John, I was very pleased to hear your uh, presence here. You developed Atlas Neo Warning System. So that's the kind of warning system we should be able to uh, utilize for realistic, extremely short-term situation. However, Atlas was initially uh, uh, developed just for evacuation, not for plant defense. But our conceptual study in university setting, that is the base warning system. So basically, that system allows three week sort of mission lead time when the size is hundred and, uh, larger than 140 meter, and then one week, one day, even one hour. And then, for we, if we have one week lead time, then we can intercept target far outside the lunar orbit. So it depends on available time to impact, but unfortunately, the worst, worst case, we have to uh, intercept target asteroid at 2,000 kilometer if we have one hour uh, sort of time to impact. Totally academic situation, but that may happen. So planetary defense one-on-one, -on -one, I don't want to go through that. I just want to emphasize that there is a difference between kinetic impactor and kinetic energy impactor. And disruption often means dispersive pulverizes. We are not talking about disruption into two pieces. And one megaton yield NED with 1,000 kilogram mass has a stored energy of about four petajoules. That's the kind of baseline number. So let's look at a few basic numbers. So 10,000 kilogram heavy vehicle at uh, 10 kilometer per second speed for 100 meter diameter spherical asteroid with nominal density of 2000s. Linear momentum is this number, but I don't feel anything about that number. It looks large, but the key point is the, the effective delta V is about 10 centimeter per second. So all these numbers are reference number. There's no reason for choosing 100 meter, 10 kilometer per second. So we can easily scale down. So kinetic energy turns out to be energy required for dispersed pulverization is very small, which can be achieved by this 10,000 kilogram device, the kinetic impactor. So surprisingly, you may go back to the 1995 conference held at the Lawrence Livermore Lab, 
And there's a very interesting paper, and one of the authors is uh, Ed Teller. And they, in 1995, they also look at the use of non-nuclear option for disruptions. It's an amazing kind of situation in 1995. But they, are, they were proposing the use of spinning a net. So they were relying on so-called mass efficiency of hypervelocity impact. So in other words, one kilogram spacecraft can disrupt million kilogram target object. That is the ratio. So that is the concept used by these scientists at the time frame to develop this some kind, is somewhat very uh, unrealistic large space platform. But hopefully, in the near future, we can develop. So they also propose the use of truss uh, structures. So it's not a solid body, but it's still large. So our concept is all based on previous results like this. Another concept we were using is, uh, so uh, you might you ask about hypervelocity hyper terminal guidance. Yes, most of these anti-ballistic missile guidance system is a hypervelocity terminal intercept guidance system between 10 to 15 kilometer uh, speed. So let's jump. So basically our simple is very, uh, concept is very simple. Based on this kind, instead of using 10 ton class, we cannot build such a heavy uh, kinetic impactor with high agility. So we have to split it into small 1,000 kilogram level. So we explore single impact 5,000 kilogram, and then we distribute the 5,000 kilogram chi, and we found out that it turns out to be a more effective shock wave propagation for porous rubble part asteroids. So instead of using single large lump mass, we hit the target properly distributed locations. Very simple idea, all based on previous study results. So we first tried ANSYS commercial software. We look at and we saw some possibility of uh, efficiency improvement and then uh, our uh, graduate student developed his own GPU-based 2D hydro core simulation, but still we were not getting quantitative uh, the results in terms of smallest size of fragment. It's all fluid behavior, so I cannot tell about, but it's more effective. You can see that. And then next topic is multi-impact guidance system design, multiple target. And then we successfully demonstrate the technical feasibility of hypervelocity guidance. And then also we look at availability heavy lift launch vehicle, including uh, uh, Falcon Heavy, SLS. So we did a 30 day uh, mission design for PDC, asteroid PDC 2015. So about two week flight and then one week dispersion time. And then we were able to achieve sort of mission goal, conclusions, basically the summary of what I just mentioned. But we do need 3D hydrodynamic code validation of this concept. We were not able to do that because of computational limit, also the difficulty of including porosity and rubble pile that is beyond the scope of our research team. So next topic is basically 3D hydro code simulation of it's a simple, very simple concept already proposed in 1995 by Dr. Teller. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one brief question. Yes. Okay, uh, in the middle. Where? Microphone's coming. Hi, Bong. Yes, hi. Uh, question for you. This is really cool. Um, have you looked at how much of your multi-impactors hitting off axis there is going to go into angular momentum, into spin rather than um, linear push? No, we, we didn't yet. include that angular momentum because if we assume that it's ideal, equally distributed, same. So, 
but okay. it turns out will turns out to be is a microsecond uh, the action time. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have much time to move this heavy rock. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, but it should be included. I think. Eventually. More well, professional like you should <laughs> oh. include that effect. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Okay, excellent. Let's thank our speaker. Okay, so that brings us to the conclusion of the first part of session four. We'll continue session four first thing tomorrow morning after we resume the conference. Um, uh, for now, we're going to move to a break. Um, so everybody should return here and be seated uh, by 16.30, at which time we'll begin the next press briefing to continue our hypothetical threat exercise. Okay, thank you.